Yum! Cardboard. Hey everyone and welcome to this first video in my series on making the giant board game slash game show. I'm going to be showing you some hyperlapse videos showing the process of how everything is coming together and this one is going to be more about the, the actual physical playing spaces. As well I want to get into discussions about current issues in this video specifically about the coronavirus and how it affects our lives. Uh, give my two cents and get some debate going as well because I like talking about world issues and we'll go from there. So here's the first video. Let's get at it. As alluded to in my previous video, I own sheets upon sheets of premium industrial grade cardboard. This lot here of 25 you see, this is 275 pound double wall corrugated cardboard I initially got to make my 3D glow in the dark posters for my Comic Con appearances this year. But since those conventions have been rescheduled or cancelled, I'll use these to become the game board spaces. What you see here is a basic template made for each of the game spaces. I commonly make Bristol board templates for all my crafts. Using Bristol board I got from the dollar store, I make a 1 inch by 1 inch grid pattern and decide to make each game space a 24 inch octagon. An octagon shape, I feel, is the most versatile option to allow the game to flow in multiple directions. I will need to trace out two copies per cardboard sheet. Each cardboard sheet is 24 inches by 48 inches. Okay, going forward, you'll see the work involved to cut out 50 octagons, two per space to be glued together for a total of 25 playing spaces. I have to trace out 50 copies, then cut and then glue them together. It's a long process that took about two hours and some occasional hand cramps, but here's the fast version. And while you watch me trace, cut, and glue away, with my family occasionally walking past and lovingly chatting my ear off, I want to discuss the current coronavirus pandemic. This outbreak affects us all, and I know we'll get through this, but will we change enough to avoid the next outbreak? Let's hope. I'm not going to debate the severity of the outbreak or the numerous conspiracy theories that are out there, if they're true or not. I do believe this outbreak is real. And hearing people say that the common flu kills more people is a moot and meaningless point. And I respect the current actions governments around the world are taking to stop this global catastrophe. What worries me is how we got here after getting warnings for years. Our stubbornness against adapting and changing our behaviors and our nasty tendency to be reactive versus preventative. I hate to sound like a pessimist, but I have my reasons for thinking this way. Hell, the movie Contagion gave us a roadmap nine years ago, which was inspired by the SARS outbreak, the same outbreak we were supposed to learn from originally, but only now people are heeding the warnings. For a bit of comparison and context, let's go back to the 2008 financial crisis, that complicated predatory real estate worldwide multi-billion dollar Ponzi-like scheme that was guaranteed to fail. I use the term Ponzi based on a conversation I had with a banking financial expert in 2010. Note, he's Canadian, and Canada did not allow big banks to participate in subprime mortgages or predatory lending, for reasons that are, are now obvious. He said he was dumbfounded with the whole shadow banking subprime scheme thing, and he told me it was inevitable, based on what he understood, that it was going to implode on itself and cause mass financial calamity, just like a Ponzi scheme does, especially with little oversight by government. Yet, the most prominent financial institutions around the world went ahead to profit in the short term. Whole companies and countries collapsed financially, mass job losses, and yet those at the top walked away unscathed. The regulations enacted after the collapse to stop this from happening again are now being fought in court. Many powerful people think those regulations are unnecessary now. They learned their lessons. But did you know that subprime mortgages still exist today? But now they're called non-prime mortgages. The cycle starts anew, but with some tweaks. To me, what has happened with this coronavirus echoes the same hubris of ignoring signs of potential calamity for short-sighted financial gain. And this does begin in China this time around. But it's not limited to China. And no, I'm not going to call this the Chinese flu, because doing so leads people away from learning the mistakes of what's going on. Because here's the truth, other countries have done the same thing in the past. SARS, MERS, Ebola, bird flu, mad cow disease, swine flu. There's a long list of outbreaks that have started in numerous countries and the theme is common, to me anyways. It's the same thing. 
It's the desire to make as much profit off of meat sales by cutting corners when it comes to overproduction while lacking hygiene and basic hygienic storage and sales standards. And then there is the consumption of exotic endangered animals that naturally carry diseases. Eating these animals isn't a, a big a part of the problem as the cross-contamination that occurs in unsanitary wet markets found in Asia, Africa, and South America. Mad cow disease was caused in North America and Europe due to unsanitary storage and feeding conditions in mega farms. And exactly who needs to eat a civet cat, which has already been proven to be a contributor to SARS, pangolins, which are just so cute and such helpless animals, and bats, which carry a whole host of diseases. Yes, we have dominion over this earth, but that doesn't mean we have to eat every bloody thing on it. I love eating meat, but there are limits. Both Mother Nature and Bill Gates have been trying to warn us about this situation for years. SARS and Ebola have shown the world how we like to run around like children hopped up on sugar trying to find solutions. And when we eventually find those solutions, how we forget them years later until the next outbreak happens. Here's a little eerie factoid to show as an example of how stubborn we can be when it comes to taking outbreaks seriously and how we forget. Back in 1854, Dr. John Snow figured out that contaminated water caused a cholera outbreak in London, England, and even after presenting concrete proof, authorities didn't believe him. Many more people had to be infected and died before the authorities reluctantly came around. Science was ignored even though proof was right there. Fast forward 165 years to 2019, and the same thing happened to Dr. Li Wangliang when he tried to sound the warning about the coronavirus in China. For whatever reason, there are those with power and influence over the rest of us who choose to ignore the advice of those with knowledge because that true knowledge contradicts their assumptions on how things should work. Climate change and pollution are other examples, but I won't go there in this video. But this mindset of my assumptions are always right is not just limited to those in power. Too many of our fellow citizens choose to ignore trying to flatten the curve because they choose to see the coronavirus as just fake media propaganda, or it's just a little cold or a little flu that gets in the way of their fun times, gets in the way of what they feel like doing. This is why beaches stayed open and spring breakers went to where they wanted to go, only to come back and complain about self-isolation. Teens want to believe they're indestructible, and many older people want to believe that they could outthink nature. I recently had to beg a family member to reconsider not going on a luxury cruise. After sending this family member a video by Dr. Michael Osterholm, in which he clearly explains why ships are the worst places to be during a disease outbreak. That family member finally decided not to go, but took a lot of convincing for that to happen. Way more convincing that should have been necessary. I'm sure many of you watching this probably have gone through the same thing with your loved ones. Or maybe you're one of the people who had to be stringently encouraged not to go and do something against the norm. And of course, we now have scams galore by people who see opportunities to profit off of misery. I do love capitalism. I still think it's the best system we have in the world. But like every human invention, it has its ugly and dire side. An ugly side that leads to more death and more spread of disease. You know, consume silver and vitamin C and you'll be fine. Here, buy some of this holy water from my tap. Then flock to your local church and hug up the oldest person you could find. They'll be fine. I could talk about the hoarding thing. But to me, that's a natural reaction by people who are scared. You want to ensure you have enough to sustain yourself and your family if things go really bad. And yes, the media attention is not good, but it is what it is. The same thing happens just before a hurricane every year. People rush to get things just before the hurricane hits. They don't plan ahead of time. However, the hoarding of toilet paper still makes no sense to me. I don't get it since coronavirus does not cause diarrhea, but I digress. The fact there are PSAs on washing hands is just sad. Let's just be honest about that, people. That there has to be ads and constant reminders to wash hands. We could put satellites into space, manufacture cell phone-sized mega computers that could get lost with your pocket lens in your pocket, and create bullet trains that go at ridiculous speeds. Yet washing hands is still a mystery. Going to the cleaned-out grocery store to see bare shelves of hand sanitizer, yet full shelves full of hand soap, is not a good sign. Ultimately, we're heading into a recession. No economist can deny that. 
They will sugarcoat it so it does not cause more hoarding and hysteria, but the writing is on the wall. Never in our industrialized history, even during past recessions, have so many industries been closed at the exact same time with so many people out of work. Unemployment claims have hit new highs never before seen or imagined, and government coffers will struggle to recoup EI payments with a tax base that's diminished by people not working. It's time for a pause in my little reality check rant here. So, so far, you've been watching me make this game, and all I've done is spout out some dreary talking points. You see, I'm a realist, and I love reading about history. I believe we can only get better if we acknowledge what is going on, no matter how painful, and then understand where we came from. Acknowledge the bad so we can reach the good. I have no doubts that we'll emerge out of this mess by probably fall of this year. Not because the virus will be defeated or eradicated, but because it will become part of life, like the common flu, and our economic system must recover. Coronavirus will be the new ongoing flu to emerge yearly, and if a vaccine can be made, a working vaccine, and we ignore anti-vax dribble, we can deal with it and learn to adjust, because we have no choice. It's my hope that in 2021 and onward, instead of making changes for a while, and then want some new government official give in to deregulation and again also listen to industries go on about how they'll self-regulate themselves, which never really works and will lead to a next outbreak. We could break this damn cycle that has gone on for hundreds of years. Keep our individual liberties, but still have regulations and rules that lead to societal safety. This outbreak will change things going forward. It already has. Society as a whole and how it interacts will never be the same. This has put some serious fear into us, and maybe for the growth of our future society and for our kids, this is a good thing. You know what else is a good thing? This stage of the game is complete. It's all glued up and compressed for the next 24 hours. The next video will be about painting and determining which space does what. And my talking points in that video will be more about the idea of the nice guy about relationships in this current and soon to be post COVID-19 world. I'm looking forward to talking about the mental health and self actualization issues that go along with that. Cheers and thanks for watching. Please leave your comments below and debate away. I'm down for you telling me I'm wrong. Let's talk. All the best until the next video.